I have the pleasure today of introducing Dr. Kathleen Millen, who is a professor of pediatrics at the University of Washington School of Medicine and the associate director of the Center for Integrative Brain Research at Seattle Children's Research Institute. Dr. Millen's lab has pioneered the combined use of human and mouse genetics to understand the developmental biology and genetic basis of human developmental brain disorders. Relevant to her talk today, Dr. Millen has made foundational discoveries regarding the genetic and developmental causes of mouse and human cerebellar malformations. This work has been paradigm changing and her work has considerable impact in both basic and translational neuroscience. Science. So excited to hear your talk today. Welcome, Dr. Millen. Thank you so much. Thank you, everyone, for coming. I really appreciate your time. And I want to tell you all about the cerebellum. I have nothing to disclose. I am going to discuss the work of two people that um, initially were in my group, uh, Kimberly Aldinger, who is now just recently an assistant professor in our same department, UW Peets, and a senior scientist in my group. Parth of Haldapur. Okay, what I'm going to do today is I'm going to introduce you to the cerebellum, a pretty underappreciated part of the brain, what it does and how it develops and how it impacts several human neurodevelopmental disorders. I'm going to tell you about the genetics of those disorders and some of their developmental basis. And then I'm going to outline where we're going, what approaches we're doing, and um, try to enthuse you about the cerebellum. Okay, so the cerebellum is a part of the brain that sits nestled under the cerebral cortex adjacent to the brainstem. So why should you care about the cerebellum? It actually represents 10% of total CNS volume, but heads up, 80% of all of your cere all your CNS neurons are cerebellar neurons. And there are one particular type of neuron called cerebellar granule neurons. And they're all packed, jam-packed in this beautiful folded laminated structure nestled at the back of your head. What does the cerebellum do? The cerebellum is best known for its role in motor control. So for example, if you have recently been to the beach and walked in sand, and then that first step when you step on grass feels like weird, it's because your cerebellum knows what the motor program is, and it has all kinds of sensory information coming back to it. And it smooths and plans things. So it plans the firing or it helps smooth and coordinate the firing of all your muscles so that everything feels right. And in fact, it lives 200 milliseconds in the future because it has a model of what you're gonna do next. And when you stepped on the grass, you screwed up that model, but then it quickly adapts. And also, for example, those of you who might have had some alcohol recently and felt a little uncoordinated, that's because of uh, the cerebellum that, that prediction and planning function gets a little disjointed caused by alcohol and so movements are not smooth. So what it's doing in motor function actually is actually doing similar things to many other brain motor, many other non-motor brain circuits. And in fact, over the last few decades, it's been very clear that cerebellum is highly connected and integral to all kinds of functions in the brain beyond motor. Um, autonomic, emotional, cognitive aspects of brain functions. And in fact, there was a really cool study that showed that um, it's actually an important regular of satiety. Um, so when you ate too much, your cerebellum um, was, was uh, a little delayed in telling you that you should have stopped. <laughs> um, so it's common or it's central to most brain-wide research uh, circuits. And its common role is in predicting that future and adapting so that things are smooth. Okay, what are cerebellar disorders? So in the adult neurology field, cerebellar attacks, spinal cerebellar ataxias are a really big deal where a normally formed cerebellum here, shown in MRI, degenerates. And the most common presentation in those patients are motor difficulties. And the onset of these disorders is usually over age 18, although there are some that are earlier. There are at least 40 different types and many of the genes have been cloned and people understand that what they're doing in the developing cerebellum or in the immature cerebellum is they're causing loss of a particular class of neuron called Purkinje cells. In the pediatric world, neurodevelopmental disorders are actually 
a big focus, obviously, because it's pediatrics and, and cerebellar disorders fall into two classes, malformations, which also could be degenerative. So as the cerebellum is getting built, it actually can start degenerating. Um, and so they're developmental degenerations, not matured degenerations. Um, and also medulloblastoma is a cerebellar tumor. Okay, so what are these malformations? Cerebellar malformation disorders are very heterogeneous and they're actually pretty much under-recognized. Some have very specific imaging features, which are pathognomic. So when you see a cluster of, of imaging features, you know that that's a specific disorder. But many of these malformations are nonspecific, such as cerebellar hypoplasia. The cerebellar malformation phenotypes or, or presentations are all imaging diagnoses. They don't tell you anything about outcome. And in fact, they are, uh, they, um, it, it's, they have a very highly variable outcome in uh, cognitive and motor aspects. Uh, notably, as I said, these are imaging diagnoses. So I'm just gonna quickly show you, here's a normal cerebellum nestled against the brainstem underneath the tentorium, which splits this region from the cerebral cortex. Here is cerebellar vermis hypoplasia. The middle part of the cerebellum is small and it's in a normally sized posterior fossa or back of the skull. This is a classic one that many of you may have heard of about in medical school called Dandy Walker malformation, where the cerebellum itself is small, rotated up and away from the brainstem, and this big, huge, expanded posterior face, uh, fossa is actually a part of the whole ventricular system of the brain that is huge. There are disorders where the cerebellum is completely absent. And notably, some of these, if not all of them, but some of them also affect the brainstem. So here, where the cerebellum is tiny or gone, um, the ponte nucleus, which is normally a massive, big structure here, is also gone because the development of the cerebellum is ultimately also also intimately involved in uh, in and the mechanisms are also uh, making this ponte nucleus. So there's a whole plethora of malformations which can be identified by MRI. The problem, and and on postnatal MRI, but there's a big problem because many of many families come to this field because at prenatal imaging there are malformations or there are cerebellar abnormalities that are noted. And in fact, the second most common type of brain malformation on ultrasound and, and or MRI in prenatal screens. So when you're presented like with a, with, a, with, a, with a disorder or a malformation of the brain, the question is, what will this become? What is the outcome? And what is the counseling? It's very, very unclear. Collectively, cerebellar malformations are not so rare. And these numbers actually are all over the map um, because the epidemiology studies are very difficult to do. It's very clear that they're under-recognized. I've already told you some of them have very specific imaging features and some are pretty nonspecific. They can occur completely in isolation as in there are no other abnormalities of the brain or whole body noted, or they can be syndromic where there are other birth defects that always cluster together. The outcome, as I said, is highly variable from typical to severe cognitive impairment. And truthfully, the, the finding is that when it's syndromic, when there are other birth defects involved, the outcome is typically not fantastic. But there are people that present with really amazingly malformed or tiny cerebella that can live perfectly normal lives and not even know it until they get an adult brain scan. So for example, there was an Air Force pilot in the Iraqi war um, who was suffering from migraines. He had an MRI. He noticed he was noted to have this malformation, Dandy Walker malformation. He lost his license, flight license because the medical decided that, oh, his brain malformation was bad. And so he clearly wasn't qualified to be a pilot and we were involved in a uh, legal lawsuit saying that this was a malformation he'd had all his life. And clearly he was highly functional and this brain malformation had nothing to do with 
anything. He, 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 he was a perfectly uh, unaffected individual. That's a problem when you're presented with a prenatal scan trying to predict what outcome, it, what outcome you're going to have. Okay, not only that, I've shown you some really dramatic brain malformations, but the, the malformations can be very subtle. So, for example, they're heterogeneous, but up to 10 to 30 percent of kids with autism are shown to have cerebellar structural abnormalities, and there's a huge ascertainment bias. So if on prenatal scans the kids are noted to have a brain malformation, they'll be studied postnatally and have more brain scans, which will confirm the brain malformation or not. Many kids present with autism-like features or autism, and many kids that have autism are not scanned, so we don't know what their brain malformations are. There's massive ascertainment bias. Another thing I want to touch on is medulloblastoma. Medulloblastoma is a malignant childhood cerebellar tumor. There are four different types, and uh, they can be pretty aggressive, actually. Survival rate is high, but there are multiple subtypes, some of which are actually very severe. 20% of all childhood brain tumors um, are actually cerebellar tumors, and in fact, I'm going to tell you a story that we think we've identified the cell of origin of the most common and most aggressive type of tumor. Okay, so here's again, just to emphasize, there are multiple different cerebellar malformations, and even in the postnatal world, these distinguishing between these different types of malformations can be problematic. There are pathognomic features, so this is called Jobert syndrome, where the cerebellum is small, and if you take a section through the head this way, you see a structure malformation of the midbrain, which normally looks like this with a big, huge pond sitting on top. But here, there's a complex malformation of the midbrain in addition to the cerebellum. This is called the molar tooth malformation, not because they have problems with their molar teeth, but that malformation looks like a molar teeth uh, cartoon that you see like uh, advertising dentist's office. Um, that is a pathognomic feature which defines this particular malformation. A bunch of genes are known, and we can pretty, pretty much give you some good prognostication about what uh, the outcome will be. But again, problematically, many of these features that distinguish these malformations are not evident till much later in the second trimester or postnatally, because the cerebellum, I haven't told you, develops its massive growth and features that distinguish these things really late in development. So this is the problem that's presented at postnatal or prenatal imaging. Here's a normal cerebellum. You're cutting through an image this way. Here's this forebrain. Here's the cerebellum. It's a little barbell structure. And then this is the posterior fossa. They all have size norms, growth norms, well-described. And here, if you take a sagittal image, here's the cerebellum sitting on top of the brainstem. In these malformation, what distinguishes them from normals is that there's a big, huge increase in the size of the lateral, or the fourth ventricle, and the cerebellum is small, and you can see that here. But what is the outcome of this? And in fact, studies done here, actually, with Joseph Sieber, have shown that there's a very poor concordance of mid-gestation fetal imaging and the postnatal diagnosis. Um, part of that is education. A lot of a lot is not being really done on outcome studies for prenatal studies, but um, part of it is also that we don't really understand how to dis define these features when the development features haven't happened. So I'm going to tell you two stories. Uh, one driven by Kimberly Aldinger, and a second one of fetal pathology driven by Parthiv Haldapur. Okay, several years ago. Kimberly Aldinger, uh, together with Bill Dobbins, who was also uh, a professor of pediatrics here at uh, Seattle Children's, uh, start, uh, set out to do a genetic analysis of cerebellar malformations. And they particularly focused on not the, not the malformations where there were specific pathognomic features or defined patterns that implicated other genes, but in these vague malformations in postnatal kids where the overlap between phenotypes is not clear and 
clearly the, the medical literature is a mess. And so what we decided, what, what Kim and uh, Bill and others, including myself, decided to do was to do some genetic sequencing in these individuals. And they used whole exome sequencing where they just took not the whole genome, but the chunk of the genome where the coding of the genes are the, the, the codes for the proteins. And they looked for abnormalities in the genes or the coding regions that make the proteins um, in these individuals. And in fact, they did it in families. They did 57 families with Dandy Walker malformation, which is this very specific clinical imaging presentation where the cerebellum is small and there's a massive posterior fourth ventricle expansion. And then this less specific malformation, which is cerebellar vermis hypoplasia, or the middle part of the cerebellum is small. What they found was, after very much work, this was an amazing study, they found molecular diagnoses in 36 patients, so about 30% of the patients they actually solved, and 41 pathogenic, likely pathogenic variants in 27 genes. So these are big numbers, but what this says is there's a whole heck of a lot of genes that are driving these gene defects that are driving these malformations and probably not a specific pathway or specific set of genes. So to summarize, they solved about 30% of the genes, or 30% of the cases. In a third, a third of the uh, individuals, there was evidence of prenatal injury and another third was unsolved. So I'm gonna focus on the solved ones first. Interestingly, and maybe not so much of a shock, the genes that were found had all previously been found to cause intellectual disability disorders. So there were none that were specific to the cerebellum. And in fact, many of these actually had never really been previously known to have cerebellar malformations. So this is a good example. Oh, no, this is not a good example. Here. Um, here. For example, we found mutations in L1CAM. L1CAM is kind of famous in neurodevelopmental disorder uh, clinics for causing hydrocephalus. Apparently, cerebellar malformations are also a part of it. And when, we, when Kim searched through the literature, she found a whole bunch of MRIs where the cerebellum abnormality was pretty clear but had been overlooked. The take-home message is that many neurodevelopmental disorders also include the cerebellum. Our cohort was skewed toward the extreme end of the spectrum where there were more severe malformations. But if you go to the other end, that you can find cerebellar abnormalities. So many intellectual disability disorders have cerebellar invo involvement, and that has been underappreciated. What she also found was there was a bias in the cases that she could solve. So of all of the cerebellar hypoplasia or the small cerebellum cases, about half of them were actually solved genetically. So that's actually a pretty high hit rate for exome sequencing. So we know the cause of about half of the cerebellar malformation or the cerebellar hypoplasia kids. Interesting, the kids with this malformation, Danny Walker malformation, we had a really low hit rate. And in fact, the only cases that we solved in this Dandy Walker malformation were the syndromic cases where there were other birth defects, but isolated Dandy Walker malformation actually was not really solved at all from this approach. If we look at intellectual disability, we again solved about half of the kids that had intellectual disability, we found a causative gene. And in fact, the kids that didn't have intellectual disability, we actually, this approach was really poor in identifying a genetic cause. We do know that in across our whole cohort, there's evidence of prenatal injury where there's evidence of twinning, prematurity, and female, fetal blades. So we believe that uh, vascular accidents are actually a significant cause of cerebellar abnormality independent of the phenotype. Um, and in fact, uh, of the genes that we solved, there were, there were enrichments for genes that are involved in vascular development. So some of this vascular injury may have a genetic predisposition, but probably not all. I'm gonna put a pin in that and, and leave you with the thought that cerebellar disorders are actually generic neurodevelopmental disorders and a subset probably involve vascular injury.
One of the reasons that we study the cerebellum, and, and in fact, one of the reasons I actually got involved in cerebellar developmental disorders in general, was because the cerebellum has a conserved function and structure across all of mammals and all of animals that have a cerebellum, all vertebrates. So here's a mouse. You're looking down at the back of a head of a, of a mouse, and this is what a mouse cerebellum looks like. It's got a middle part, vermis, and two halves called hemispheres. And if you take a sagittal section through this, you can see, again, it's a lovely foliated structure that has beautiful lamination. And in fact, the cerebellum has been studied in mice for more than 100 years because it's a fabulous substrate for genetic studies. When it's altered, the mice fall over because they're motorly, they have motor coordination issues. When you see this structure malformed, it's obvious to see. And in fact, that lamination uh, correlates with a beautiful circuit that's pretty well understood. Humans have this same genetic or generic plan of the cerebellum with a middle and two hemispheres. You can see it's much more elaborated, but the same basic structure happens. You can see that there's sort of a three-leaf clover here in mice. There's a three-leaf clover here in humans. And obviously, it's much more elaborated. But that same laminar structure is there. OK, so why am I studying human disorders? I'm studying human disorders because of this. We know a heck of a lot of how the cerebellum develops based on mouse studies. Over 100 years of mouse studies, where people have either uh, isolated spontaneous mouse mutants that have motor coordination uh, issues in large colonies of breeding mice, or people that have specifically engineered gene mutations um, that affect the cerebellum. And these are some of the cerebellar malformations I've worked on in my career. Here's a wild type mouse, sort of it's flipped on its side here, middle, two sides. This is a mouse we've done a lot of work on. Um, where the middle part of the cerebellum is missing, but the two sides are still there. This is an opposite phenotype where there's too much middle and not enough sides. And then these are all kinds of issues with cerebellar malformation or cerebellar disorders. Based on 100 years of malformations, uh, we actually know a lot about how the cerebellum develops. And because we know how, it, how the cerebellum develops in a mouse, the, the premise of my career has been that because we understand how the mouse develops, we should understand how the human develops, and we should be able to understand these human malformations. So to get there, I'm going to show you a really brief overview of mouse cerebellar development so that you can understand what I'm going to talk about in human. So this is a mouse embryo mid-gestation. Here's its head. There's its developing ear. It's on its side. Its heart is underneath here. Its tail's around here. And here's its forelimbs and its hind limbs. And all of this is forebrain, midbrain, and this is its hindbrain. The cerebellum is derived from the anterior and dorsal, so from the front and top of the hindbrain. If you take a, a slice through this mouse in the plane of the screen and focus in on this region, you get to what we call the cerebellar onlog. So this is a bump that's going to develop into this, and it's going to do it really rapidly in mice and very dramatically. What's going to happen is on this side, internal to the, to the, to the uh, ventricle system of the brain here, adjacent to the ventricle system, this bump here is a zone of neurogenesis that's going to give rise to a whole bunch of neurons. It's going to proliferate, and then neurons are going to differentiate and push up into this middle field here called the cerebellar onlog. And those are going to be Purkinje cells and other GABAergic or inhibitory types of neurons. And that's going to make the bulk of the cerebellum for a little bit. Because in the meantime, cells just at this junction, highlighted by this purple thing here, cells at this junction between the ventricular zone and the, the roof plate that's going to turn into the choroid plexus is a stem cell population called the rhombic lip. It looks really boring. It's just a little blip, turns into a little triangle, little triangle, and then it like rapidly disappears. But that blip is so important because remember I told you 80% of all of your CNS neurons are from the cerebellum and they're one type of neuron. The major thing that that rhombic lip is doing is it's pumping out progenitors that dive or, or they migrate over the top of all of these other neurons that were born from the bottom. And then they proliferate like crazy up here. And as they proliferate like crazy, 
they expand that on log. And as they expand that on log, it becomes foliated. And then as they finish proliferating, they're gonna dive down in and form what's called the internal granular layer. And that's what's gonna drive foliation and that's what's gonna drive the growth of the cerebellum and the lamination of the cerebellum. There you go, you now understand all of cerebellar development. <laughs> okay, so as I said, the premise of my career has been that mouse cerebellum is a heck of a lot like human cerebellum. And because we know a lot about mouse cerebellum, we should understand human cerebellum and cerebellar disorders. So many years ago, uh, we identified several genes that caused this malformation or Dandy Walker malformation. And in fact, some of this work was done by Kim Aldinger when she was in my lab many years ago at the University of Chicago. Um, we found that based on sets of patients that had deletions of chromosomes. And we, when he lined up where all those deletions were, they highlighted the location of causative genes. So one of the genes that we found was caused by a deletion of the short arm of chromosome six. And there was one gene on there that was really important called FOXC1. And so when we made mice that had FOXC1 deletions, we were very delighted to show that the FOXC1 mutant cerebellum looked kind of like the human cerebellum when you didn't have FOXC1. With caveats that obviously mice are not human. But there were many features of the cerebellum that were actually really beautifully mimicking the Dandy Walker phenotype. And one of those is this one here. So I've showed you here a normal cerebellum. You can see each lobe is nicely folded and the, the two leaves of the, the, the each lobule are interfacing. But in our FOXY1 mice, a very common feature was that the very last leaf or folia of the cerebellum is not opposed to another one. It didn't fold back on itself. And in fact, that's something we see really commonly in Dandy Walker scans of uh, affected individuals. We see this weird tail, which we are beginning to think is now pathognomic or def definitive for a subtype of one of these cerebellar malformations. Um, we were really excited by this because we said, wow, we're really mimicking human cerebellar development in mice. We're super proud of ourselves. And not only that, because they're mice and we can study mice in many, many ways, we can study how this develops, how you failed to make the back end of the cerebellum. And again, without going into many details, the back end of the cerebellum in development is not forming correctly. And it's, you can see, like, it's, just, it's not organized here. We were patting ourselves on the back at this point. And not only that, but we identified three cases of mid-gestation uh, fetuses that had this very specific genetic deletion that, that included the FOXY1 gene. And so we had developmental cases, prenatal cases of humans that looked a lot like our mice. So we were like, yes, mice are really fantastic models for humans we are totally going to understand human cerebellar malformations based on all of this cross-human mouse work. All was very good until January 17th, 2017, when, to be diligent, we went to find some normally developing fetal cerebellum from human to see you know, just as a control, we need to make sure that like the control looks normal and these look abnormal, right? So all was well, okay, this is normal, but wait a minute, there were several details of this normal developing human fetus that were completely alien to us based on everything we knew about mice. And that led to an odyssey where um, we have visited a historic museum in, uh, uh, NIH, um, the, the pathology, uh, the, the, the Museum of Anatomy um, at NIH um, contains the Carnegie collection of embryos. So these are the classic embryo collection that were generated in the 20s, 1908 to 1920 something. And based on all of that collection embryology, I don't know if any of you know here, but there is a Carnegie collection or the Carnegie stages of human development. We went to the museum, we looked through all their vast collections. We have collaborated with pathologists and tissue banks all across the world 
to finally describe human cerebellum because we were shocked to discover in 20, 2017 that nobody had actually described how the human cerebellum develops, especially in light of everything we know about mouse development. Okay, so why is this important? So something that I and many in the field had ignored all of our career is that the human cerebellum is not a mouse cerebellum. There are massive differences between a mouse cerebellum and the human cerebellum. The human cerebellum has a 750 fold surface area because it's so foliated. It's got increased complexity, obviously in folia. You can see that the middle part, the vermis is tiny relative to the hemispheres. In, in mice, the vermis is about the same size as the hemispheres, so you can divide it into thirds. Clearly, there's been massive expansion of the cerebral, of, of the cerebellar hemispheres. And in fact, across evolution, in primates in particular, the scale of the expansion of the cerebellar hemispheres exactly scales with the expansion of the cerebral cortex, which is actually indicative of the important role of cerebellum in non-motor things like cognition and emotion. Um, and not only that, but there are massive more neurons in the human cerebellum and the ratios of all the types of neurons in the human compared to the mice are very different. Okay, so maybe mice are not the best human models. So we decided we should describe human cerebellar development. So we did. And this is gonna be reminiscent of that slide that I showed you before of mouse development. There are many things that are different about human cerebellar development. So first of all, the length of development. So the cerebellar on log, when it's just this little bump before you've made a lot of neurons, is evident at least by 30 days post conception. We don't have any data earlier um, and likely never will just because of the inability to obtain those embryos. Um, and in fact, it's going through the same progression of steps. You're making all these neurons from this bottom region, the ventricular zone it's called, and stuffing those differentiating neurons into this bulk of the developing cerebellum. This rhombic lip is making its rhombic lip kind of things, including the progenitors that lie on top of the cerebellar on log and then proliferate like crazy and eventually dive down in to make this. But that whole progress from 30 days to about eight post-conception weeks is when all of the big Purkinje cells and the inhibitory neurons of the cerebellum are made. This EGL or external granular layer proliferates and proliferates and proliferates and proliferates. And in fact, that proliferation is not complete until the second postnatal year in humans. So cerebellar development is at least two and a half years. Um, and on top of that, because the human cerebellum is so big, one of the reasons that the cerebellum is so big is because these granule neurons, which are proliferating and proliferating, making so many, there are way more of those compared to the other cells. So for example, in a mouse, there are 200 Purkinje cells to, or 200 granule neurons to one Purkinje cell. In humans, there are 5,000 granule neurons to one Purkinje cell. There are many, many features of this cerebellum that are really interesting and relative, relevant to uh, clinical uh, issues experienced by kiddos you see. So for example, if you look here at 21 weeks post-conception, from 21 weeks to birth, the cerebellum increases five times in volume, 30% or 30 times increased in surface area because of the driving proliferation and growth of that external granular layer. We have preemies grown here, they're born here. All of this extensive development happens outside the uterus and work of uh, Parth of Haldipur in my group and others have shown that the outside uterus uh, environment impacts the development of these proliferating neurons out here and be, are proliferating progenitors, causing them to proliferate less and differentiate early. And when you differentiate less and proliferate, or when you proliferate less and differentiate early, that has immediate impacts on size of the cerebellum because I told you that that proliferation drives size, but it also has less obvious but important problems um, on how the circuit is formed because things are in the wrong place at the wrong time and so the circuit doesn't develop in a normal way and um, there are 
circuit outcome issues because of that. Okay, so to focus on the rhombic lip here, um, these are high scale pictures of this region here, that rhombic lip that gives rise to all of those many neurons. And you can see up close, it does really amazing things. It changes dramatically across development. It's not like a little blip in mice. It starts out as a blip. It actually divides into two zones separated by a vascular net here. Um, that vascular net is actually present all the way through. And in fact, those progenitors in that region, in that very back here of the posterior vermis, um, are present at least until birth. So notably, we don't know what normal cerebellar development looks like from 21 post-conception weeks to birth is because all of those samples that are available in museums and from pathologists were either stillborn or terminations. Um, and so we don't know what normal looks like, but at least where we can tell from our stillborn samples, um, there are progenitors that are proliferating and likely contributing to the growth of the posterior vermis um, right up until birth. I told you that it that that region here uh, in the rhombic lip here, not so obvious here, but it's two zones actually split by a vascular bed. So I'm going to zoom up that. Here's the vascular bed here, and each zone of progenitors of highly proliferating. Um, progenitors that are going to make these granule neurons and other neurons um, have unique gene expression signatures. And in fact, the other thing I haven't told you is that this elaborate rhombic lip does not exist in mice. Doesn't exist in mice. We have data showing it doesn't exist in macaques. We have data it doesn't exist in dolphins. Um, we don't know about other species. We don't know if it's a brain versus body size or if it's primate specific, probably not. Or is it a function of long gestation? Probably not because we don't see it in dolphins. But maybe the human rhombic lip is special. What I'm gonna tell you is that human rhombic lip being special is really important because it's made us refocus on what's causing cerebellar birth defects and actually, we think this rhombic lip region is a focus of a lot of human cerebellar developmental pathology. I told you already that about Dandy Walker uh, malformation, um, where the back part of the cerebellum is abnormal. I'm going to tell you also a story about medulloblastoma. So in our Dandy Walker cases, so this is a postnatal case of a six-year-old MRI, but these are what Dandy Walker looks like to the best of our knowledge prenatally, and you can see the cerebellum is small, upturned, like the postnatal, and there's this little tail. We call it the Dandy Walker tail. And when you do histology, you can see that the back end of the cerebellum is not made correctly, and in fact, the angles and, and measurements are odd. Part of Hal DeBoer, together with colleagues across the world, essentially, um, have collected we first published 26 cases of Dandy Walker and other cases where the cerebellum was small at mid-gestation but didn't have the tail, and a bunch of age-matched normal controls. That was 26 cases of Dandy Walker. We have certainly since then increased um, the numbers significantly since then. But you can see this cerebellum does not look normal. And if you focus just on this part, the rhombic lip, that stem area that's going to give rise to all of those neurons, it's absent or delayed or malformed in almost all of the cases. This is what a normal cerebellum should look like at these stages. These don't look anything like that. And when you do a lot of analysis at proliferation, so these are those two zones, the inner and the outer, or the ventricular zone and the subventricular zone, you can see that proliferation is a down across the whole rhombic lip and in each subdomain. And in fact, the progenitors marked by specific markers are also down. So we also have shown that not only is proliferation down, but we're getting early differentiation of one of the, 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 the cells that comes from the rhombic lip called a unipolar brush cell, which I haven't talked about before, but it's an important part of the cerebellar circuitry. And we're getting ectopic differentiation of those neurons. And we know from most studies, if you get ectopic or delayed, or if you get differentiation and input into the cerebellar circuit at the wrong time and place, you have significant 
uh, implications on how the output of the cerebellum actually is, is working. Okay, so not only is the cerebellum messed up in the rhombic lip, the cerebellum clearly does not look anything like normal individuals. So the problem is we aren't ever going to get samples earlier than this from humans because prenatal screening doesn't happen until these are identified. So we don't know what happens earlier, but everything we know about the mouse is sort of translational, can be translated to, to humans. And we think that obviously something much earlier happened and I don't have time to go through it, but we are pretty convinced that disruptions of this vascular bed in this rhombic lip, when it's really long and fragile much earlier, are actually central to causing this pathology. So again, our human genetics are saying, at least in some cases of cerebellar malformations, vascular system is important or vascular disruption is important. And our fetal histology is also telling us vascular histology is important or vascular disruption. Switching the bit, so we have all these amazing, very precious human fetal samples, both normal and abnormal. What can we do with them? We can't treat human beings or human samples like mice. How can we study human cerebellar development? One way we can do that is to look at all of the genes are expressed in all of the cells at all of the developmental time points. And that's called single cell RNA sequencing. So Kim Aldinger again, generated an atlas of human cerebellar development, looking at all of the genes across these stages of development and defining all the different cell types based on their gene expression signatures. And she can map them against mouse and really excitingly, maybe not so surprisingly, because the mouse looks like a human, the cell types match across the different species and their development match across the species, except for this rhombic lip population that I've been talking about. And that actually has really important implications. I'm gonna to switch to medulloblastoma now. Medulloblastoma is a really terrifying tumor of, this, of the pediatric population. Um, there are four different subtypes some that are based on a gene called that, that, that have malformations or disruptions in a, a pathway called WINT, some that have disruptions in a pathway called sonic hedgehog, and then these amorphous group three and group four tumors. We don't really understand the WINT tumors. The sonic hedgehog tumors are probably derived from populations of those outer proliferating neurons that give rise to the, the granule neurons. Um, and in fact, they have not as severe outcomes as the amorphous group three and group four tumors. Um, group three and group four tumors account for 60% of all medulloblastoma cases and are the most aggressive. And in fact, no one has understood where they come from um, until recently when we published a paper describing where they come from. And the, 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 the punchline is they come from the humic rhombic lip. Why did we not know that before? We found out about these sonic huge hedgehog tumors because that external population of progenitors in mouse and humans is pretty much the same. And so when they compared the tumor expression to the mouse developmental data, it was obvious where those cells came from. But when they compare group three and group four to mouse developmental data, there was no match. Well, surprise, there's no match because the human rhombic lip looks very different from the mouse rhombic lip and the expression signatures look very, very different. But when we look, this is, this is a, a projection of how these stem cells form their particular progenitors. Or the progenitors go and differentiate into the different lineages in the developing cerebellum. It turns out that when we do single cell sequencing of the tumors and look at their expression signatures and compare them to the developing human rhombic lip, we see a really big match. And in fact, it looks like human medulloblastoma really closely matches the signatures here. So groups, so sonic hedgehog are tumors, are these EGL progenitors, which are over here in red. The group three signatures match cells in the human rhombic lip and the group four signatures a little more differentiated along this pathway from the human rhombic lip. Genetically, if you look at lesions uh, in, in genomic lesions or chunks of chromosomes that are different 
in medulloblastoma compared to normal. There's an enrichment of cells that are enrichment of genes that are abnormal in the human medulloblast tumors, and where those genes are expressed are in the developing rhombic lip. That was breezing through a lot of data, obviously, because that's the audience. But what I really want to punch down here is that the rhombic lip is central to human developmental pathology. This little tiny population that's sitting here at the back of the cerebellum builds the posterior part of the cerebellum, is, and when it's when it's disrupted, either through genetic or vascular problems, early on what happens is the back half of the cerebellum vermis doesn't form correctly. When it, when, go, when it goes awry, when there are cells in here that are going awry, they get derailed and can be the, the, the focus of uh, the most aggressive types of medulloblastoma. So that's saying that in two different ways here. Um, so where are we going? Mice are not a fantastic model for human, but mice can tell us so much about human. And so we are working to try and humanize a mouse cerebellum and make these rhombic lip cells using all kinds of means by transgenesis. And we can use all of the tools from mouse development and mouse cerebellar development to understand mechanisms. And we can use all the tools that we have found from humans for embryology, imaging, transcriptomics, and even 3D cultures, um, looking at evolutions, try, I, try and understand how the human cerebellum develops. That leads to developmental biology, understanding developmental biology mechanisms. What that leads to is hopefully better diagnostics and better prognostications about what these postnatal cases are going to, what the outcomes of the postnatal cases are and maybe therapeutics. Um, the take home messages I want you to have from this talk is that cerebellar development is susceptible to injury, either genetic or non-genetic. And when it happens and where it happens defines the impact. If the, if, if the vascular injury, for example, is very early, um, that can have dramatic early causes. If it's late, for example, uh, vascular bleeds over the cere of the cerebellum, due to prematurity, that's when that EGL or that the stem cell population is massively proliferating. If you have injury and the uh, hemorrhagic injury of the cerebellum um, late during gestation, you can have a different impact yet significant because the cerebellum is central to brain circuitry in general. So if you affect cerebellar circuitry, you're gonna have outcomes beyond the cerebellum. Cerebellar abnormalities are an important and overlooked aspect of many neural developmental disorders. Um, and then if we can understand the path of the genesis of these disorders, we help to improve diagnoses and may inform treatment. So all of this work was done by a huge amount of people. The work I highlighted today, the pathology, um, was primarily driven by Parthiv Haldapur and Kim Aldinger has been driving the genetics. Um, the work has been really possible because of wonderful colleagues here at Seattle Children's, Dan Doherty, who's in developmental peds, and Ian Glass, who's in genetics here. Bill Dobbins was here in pediatrics. He's now at the University of Minnesota. Uh, Joe Siebert in pathology. And uh, Jim Olson actually provided some of the tumor samples. Uh, all of these people were massive contributors. Gerg Selig at UW uh, invented a single cell sequencing methodology called uh, SplitSeq together with these people, and that was instrumental in our analysis. We funded by the NIH and also the Dandy Walker Alliance. Cancer work was done with Paul Northcott and his group, uh, Michael Taylor and his group, and then massive numbers of pathology, pathologists and tissue banks around the world have contributed tissues to our work. Thank you very much. I really appreciate your attention and I'm happy to take any questions. It was a very broad, quick survey. Thank you so much for this groundbreaking work. For the people in the room, if you have a question, raise your hand. I'll bring you the microphone. Hi, yeah, Jeff Ogeman for those Hi, online. Hi, uh, wonderful. Uh, could you talk a little bit about the neuropsychiatric connection to the posterior vermis and yeah. just sort of speculate on uh, how, how all, all your great work might be connected to that? <laughs> yeah. I'm always happy to speculate. Um, so uh, there, there is a disorder 
called cerebellar cognitive affective disorder, um, which was first sort of defined by Jeremy Schmaman at Boston. Um, and, and I think it's evolved to a different name now, to be honest. Um, but it turns out with kids that have cerebellar tumors that are resected or uh, lesions in the cerebellum, um, there is a cluster of phenotypes that involve abnormalities in executive function, abnormalities in affect control, so they have wild mood swings, in addition to some motor issues. But the motor issues are not the predominant phenotype or feature of those patients. <laughs> You asked for this, Jeff. So, so the cerebellum is intimately connected via multiple synaptic pathways to multiple areas of the cerebral cortex. So maybe it's not so surprising that you're going to have cognitive and affect, all kinds of abnormalities in these patient populations because it's central to all kinds of brain circuits. Um, so we, we, we've developed over the last couple months, actually, this build and support hypothesis. So the cerebellum is a fundamental organizer of fundamental functional networks in the human brain. It's kind of like a scaffold initially. You build a building, you have a scaffold, and the cerebellum helps form those, those connections and those circuits. And in fact, if you have a cerebellar bleed prenatally or postnatally or preterm, you affect the other side of the cerebral, developing cerebral cortex. So if you cross the midline, you get hypoplasia of the cerebell, or cerebral cortex, even if you just have a developmental lesion in the cerebellum. So we think the cerebellum helps build and scaffold all of the networks in the brain. But once those networks are established, then it's in, in, involved in plasticity and adaptation, but it's not central to how, how, how those are actually established. So if you have a developmental disruption, you know, brain-wide consequences, because you're not going to build the building right. And so that's why cerebellar abnormalities in kids have very different phenotypes from cerebellar abnormalities when you have a neural degeneration. Because when you have neural degeneration, your house is built already. Those circuits are functional, everything's working. You lost the front porch, for example. And so you're not so good at adapt adaptation, but the phenotypes from mature cerebellar disorders where there's degeneration is very different from the developmental disruptions. So that was my speculation. <laughs> I, 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 I want, yeah. <laughs> A plan, yeah. <laughs> I should also say that the circuits are very topographically mapped in the cerebellum. So like where the social circuits are in the cerebellum, and where they are in the in the cortex are are pretty well defined, and actually they're pretty distributed. So, um, depending on where the lesion is in in the cerebellum, you'll have different effects too. All right, I think that's all the time we have, Dr. Millen. Thank you so much for all your groundbreaking work in this field. We're so lucky that we have you here at UW and Seattle Children's. And thanks to all our participants, both in the room and on WebEx. And um, please fill out an evaluation. You can see it on your screen. You'll also get one emailed to you later this afternoon. Thanks, everybody, for being here. And we'll see you all next week. Thank you. Thank you, everybody.